Hey everybody, it's Savage Lands News. I'm here today to take you through my World Calling Top 8 Reinar deck. Um, I went X2 the first day, and then undefeated the second day, of course, until Top 8. Um, and I went through a lot of really bad matchups, right? Um, set, uh, two Viscerai, three Briar, I believe. Um, a Fi. It wasn't exactly an easy climb up. Um, so I'll take you through the deck, and then I'll segue into the sideboard guide, and then we can kind of talk about some of the matchups maybe at the end. Um, but this is a 100% Mandible Claw deck. There's no club. Um, I'm considering club again. Icelander matchup and Lexi matchup are made way easier with that. But this was 100% a fair Reinar deck that was built to maximize the Blood Rush. So that's what those claws are for. Um, I took Clay and Ian's kind of core package. I always played very similar to the way they they played. Um, the secret that I was missing was Mandible Claws, actually. I always played either full turtle with club or full aggro. And, you know, I always preferred that club package, the more two-value play kind of deck. Um, it wasn't until I saw Clay and Ian's deck tech where I saw that, you know, maybe Mandible Claws is really where I should, where I should be. Um, so this is an iteration on their deck. Um... The equipment is very standard. Man, a Crown of Providence is there to bail you out on a Blood Rush turn. Maybe save you from a really bad on hit at some point in the game. Tunic is Ryanar's really only solid piece of equipment over a long course of a game. You're a grindy deck. You're going to get a lot of value out of it. Helps you with those Blood Rush turns. Helps you with Savage Feast. Helps you with Toma Fiendal. Um, Gambler's Gloves. You're going to roll. This is Ryanar. You know... Briar has Channel Mount Heroic. Viscerai has Revel and Runeblood. Uh, you have Gambler's Gloves and Scab Skins. Uh, Null Rune Gloves here. Really only taken in against Viscerai and Wizards. Skullhorn only for the Wizards. And then Scab Skins. So this piece of equipment deserves an entire video. I might even do that at some point. Uh, but Scabskins is really there for two to three pivotal plays. And, you know, it can come in if you're losing really badly, if it's a super bad matchup and you need to balance this out. But Scabskins is an interesting tool in our arsenal that we need to leverage specifically with combo cards. Um, there are two or three plays that I'll go over later that I always use Scabskins for. And, you know, they win the game right um kind of funny you'll have you know opponents who get really mad especially towards the end on that second day every game was gonna you know one of us was gonna not make it in the top eight i had several opponents who visibly got upset talked shit uh told me i high rolled them it's there's, there's an applied math to this to this equipment right you are taking a risk that risk is not as bad as it seems right you roll a one your turn's over but you have gambler's gloves, and that's what those you're committing two pieces of equipment to just scab skins, right? So you're you're not really it's not really as high roll as you would think. And one thing that I know drives opponents crazy is it's kind of like a curve. When you're losing really bad, you're gonna roll scab skins. When you're barely winning or tied, you probably aren't gonna roll scab skins unless it is like a severe advantage play. And when you pull way ahead, you tend to roll Scabskins more. At least I do, right? So if I hit my Savage Feast with uh, Scabskins, I pull ahead, get card advantage, throw in 15. I draw another one, and I'm winning. I'm probably going to roll again. So I know that's why some opponents kind of feel like they got high rolled. Because it kind of did, right? As soon as I pull Tempo, I'm not afraid to roll. I'm going to keep pushing for the victory. Um... A lot of the time when I'm losing, I won't roll because I, I need to play to the maximum. I can't lose my turn. Um, I think I only had one game in all of my matches. It was against Pankaj, Ethnic Smoke on Icelander, where I legitimately had like a, if I don't roll here, I lose moment. And, and I got it. And, uh, you know, I took the victory by one health. Um, but that was the only game I rolled without a, you know, necessary like conclusive reason to right it was just i had to he it was the and that was the only game where i had to roll to win um 
So that's Scabskins. I might make a video on that later. Um, but the core of the deck here, we've got your red Barragings. Uh, card is incredible. Um, zero for four. On a Blood Rush, it is one of the best cards if you can squeak it out with like a Swing Big and Arsenal. It'll push that Swing Big in front from doing 10 to doing 14. Uh, it's amazing. Um, tempo too, right? You can keep a blue and a Barraging Beatdown. Claw for seven. Most aggro decks won't block that. Two for seven is one damage below what your real maximum is, which is, you know, eight for two cards. Barraging is just one of the best blues also. Um, we have a lot of kind of filler blues in this deck. Most of them there are zero cost that can get out of your hand when you need to. Most of them are kind of block fodder. Um, but Barraging is probably the best, you know, non-six blue next to Reckless Swing. Um, Beast Within just enables crazy plays, right? You can f always force Beast Within, as long as you get attacked, you can always force Beast Within to be your Blood Rush target. Gives you card advantage. You need card advantage. Again, we're going for the super aggressive Blood Rush Bellows turns. So you want as many cards in your hand as possible to enable that. Um, like I said, these two blues, they intimidate. They get out of your hand when you need to dump them. You don't mind blocking, and they block three. Pat Call is an interesting card. At first, I was really against it. Um, I didn't like the idea of like just losing a Blood Rush right to the bottom of my deck for because I defended with a card from my hand. But if you really think about the math, like there's three Blood Rushes in your deck, sixty cards. Um, the likelihood is really small. And Pat Call actually sometimes really synergizes with things like Beast Within, right? You can block on your turn, Pat Call, make sure it's a six on top. If it's not, at least you take one less damage. And then when you Beast Within trigger, it, you can, you're can you closer to the six, or you drew the six. Um, Regular Swing is incredible card. Uh, I think anybody who plays Brute knows this. I think of my games, all of my world's games, I it was five or six Regular Swing kills. Um, one of those was against an incredibly intelligent, um, old hen player. I got him down to three. Um, this was the final game for top eight. Um, he knew I pitch stacked the two reckless swings. Uh, he pitch stacked himself, stopped attacking me, um, and set up like a channel mount or channel lake frigid into a pay or discard card to try and tax my hand. So I couldn't get off the reckless swings. It was such a cool game, but... This card wins games. You get them down to two, you can turtle. This deck blocks basically every card in the deck blocks three. You turtle and then you reckless swing them, right? Riled Up is just a yellow six that can end on a Blood Rush for nine, right? It's really its only purpose. It is more often blocked with than anything or pitched with. Savage Feast, another one of those cards that wasn't super sold on when I first started playing Reinar because I was just too afraid for to roll gambler's gloves uh, or roll scab skins. This card is our second or third best card in the deck in my opinion. Um, pitch a blue, savage, well, scab skins, get a four, get a five, get a six. Pitch a blue, savage feast, draw a card, claw, claw, swing big, right? And that's with blocking for one, right? You can get some pretty huge spike turns with this card while you're kind of funneling for that Blood Rush Bellows. Um, you know, Smash Instincts, interesting choice in blue. A lot of people question this choice. Um, I'm kind of, it's an okay card. My idea was that the Sand Sketch plans didn't fire so well in this version of the deck. Like, you know, your really only good target is like Savage Feast. You don't have Go Again naturally. So it's like the best you would really do is like get a Savage Feast, which is pretty good, but the likelihood of me doing that regularly just was low. And I noticed that on Blood Rush turns, I just draw two blues. And it's like, okay, I'm going to claw for 10, and that's the peak of my Blood Rush here, and that'll lose you a game, honestly, in some of those more aggressive matchups. So I just wanted another card that did damage. Um, and it intimidates, so it's like in my opinion, one of the most valuable sixes, because you can still play it five with an Intimidate is, like, pretty bad, but it's better than a Claw, right? Yellow Smash Instincts are a yellow that Intimidates, right? Swing Big, probably the highest arsenal target. Swing Big, Savage Feast, Command Conquer, Alpha Rampage, depending on the matchup, or, like, your biggest Blood Rush feeders or arsenal targets. 
Putting this in Arsenal enables the 20 plus damage blood rush guaranteed, basically, with you if you manage your tuna correctly and all of that. So this is super big priority. Also, swinging two for eight is like the ceiling of what we can do with two cards. Um, against Phi, right? I think the one of the hardest matchups for most Rhinars is Phi. You, you can block, block, swing big, right? You are two points off of the math that they would be doing if they hit you with four, go again fours, right? So it's actually very good. And no Phi is going to block this card. They're going to take it. So if you think about it, if you were to play two swing bigs for 16 and one blood rush for 24, or one blood rush for 18, one blood rush for whatever, they are now forced to block in three turns. And as soon as Phi blocks, they lose. There's no real way around it. Their two card hands never really do anything. Most of the cards block for two. So if you're coming in for seven, if you're coming in for eight, and they are forced to block, they're going to crumble. And Rekka Romp's our best blue. I mean, it's blue six. It does what it needs to do. It's there for blood rushes. It's there for, you know. Okay, the sideboard is where things get really interesting. Alpha Rampages, it's a bad card on paper, right? Three for nine. It's pretty bad. Um, Double Intimidate is really what makes it shine. So you put these in against Old Him, Bravo, Dashes. I'll put some in because they might be that control dash. Any deck that you think is going to block, right? This is there for that second cycle. You pitch it with barraging beatdowns, and it is going to break through their defense. It's going to overwhelm them. It's going to get you free damage. It is the reason I won my, I think it was three or four old Tim games at Worlds. It's just a good card for that match. Um, Arc Smash comes in for dash. If it's the control dash, this card automatically wins you the game. There's nothing else they can do about it unless they're running a bunch of remembrances, but by the time they get all their items back, you've probably killed them. Even against boost dash, I find this card very useful. At its worst, it's a blue block or a yellow block three. But at its best, um, in one of my games, I managed to kill two Tekla, uh, two Tekla Foundries or whatever, Tekla Hearts, whatever that card that generates some resources and their um, Pounder in one turn. They set it all up. They spent their whole day doing that, and I just crushed it, right? Um, Barraging Beatdown comes in. I mean, on paper, this card's not great, right? It's a, it's a zero for three, which is one bullet rate. Um, but again, in those turtle matchups, this card just lets you penetrate defense over and over and over and over again until they, you know, fold. Contraband is another one of my pet picks. At Nationals, this card won me so many games and then at worlds i basically never got to utilize it so i'm not sold on this card into dromai it is a free win you can blood rush five times um no deck can withstand that even when as defensive as dromai just throw it in an ash wing you throw it at a dragon you get your blood rush back on top of your deck and you loop them over and over and over again um I think it's still pretty decent into Fi and Rune Blades if it times right. It's a block two, so it is one of the more dangerous cards. But if you Blood Rush and they see that you did 20 damage and then you throw this at them, they have to make a decision to try and stop it or to let you Blood Rush again. And if you Blood Rush, you know, three times in a game, you're basically going to win. Um, if you Blood Rush twice in a game, you've probably won. So this card was there really for Phi, and then I just like that it was an auto win for Dromai. Um, I find that matchup taxing because the, the really good Dromais actually make you work for it. Command and Conquer, I, you know, after Crown came out, a lot of people are saying this card is going to lose its value. Uh, this card is incredible, and it's probably one of the reasons I haven't lost to Phi in, in, in Nationals or Worlds, and I think that was five games against Phi, and I didn't lose a single one. This is going to ruin their day if you do it intelligently. So something like uh, Scabskin's Swing Big, Command and Conquer. They just ate, they, they, they just took eight damage, and they're thinking to themselves, okay, I'm gonna out trade eight. It's just gonna be a six. You know, this is still within my Art of War trade range, right? And then you throw a Command and Conquer, and you can see like their facial expression at they just they just lost their whole math trade in their head about taking that eight damage. Now you're going to eat their Artivore or their Spreading Flames or whatever it is in their arsenal. Um, incredible card. Always 
try and cheat this one out against Fi with like a scab skins or you know I even uh, savage feast have a blue draw a card it's a command and conquer drop that on the table and you know you just super value traded right if they block that's all you really want them to do you block them you block give them the block a couple times and you win um a race face i at nationals only had two i went to three now mostly because i hate the dash matchup is weird as that sounds i don't like playing into dash that much um the variance is hard to control with them their boosting is hard to control right like even the mid-range like high octane dash is just randomly way too good um and viscera is one of our least winnable matchups in my opinion at least and i'll go over that later um but Array's face counters both of those decks so i, I put three in i i'm very happy i did it came in very much help versus viscera so um Pack Call or Pack Hunt, just another card here that has Intimidate on it. It's really just a two for six that you can put in your arsenal. Goes good with Blood Rush Bellows. Goes good into defensive decks. It's, it's nice. Um, Smash Instinct Red. A lot of people don't like this card. Um, but if you think about it, it is one point away from the maximum damage that you can theoretically do with like fair cards, right? Um, so normally the peak of a card is like four go again or four. Um, this is coming in for seven for two. It's one point off, and it has an intimidate printed on it. So if you can correlate intimidate to a point of damage, then it's actually on rate. Um, I use this specifically for aggro matchups, where I'm gonna block block, put something in arsenal, and then my next turn I'm gonna block block block, swing for seven or block or swing for eight. This card does it. A five will always eat the seven damage. They don't care. Same principle as Swing Big. You, you throw a couple of these and then you Blood Rush and they're blocking, right? And then we'll get into our defensive cards. So we've got three Sink Blows, a Fate for Scene, three Sigils, that all you got, and Tome of Fiendal. I mean, this could be an aggressive or a defensive card, but the Fate for Scenes come in against Boost Dash, Fi, uh, Viscerai, um, anybody who's presenting really nasty on hits. And that's really it. Um, Bravo 2, actually. Surprisingly, I don't run any into old him. Um, I don't. I never needed a D-React. I think I always ended up with one sigil just because of the floating. But I never needed them. It just I just ran the the old hymns over. They're forced to block the entire game. You're building these big combos, and there's not much they can do about it. Thought all you got ninjas. Um, originally, I was running it into like Briar and Viscerai. Briar has just the problem is Briar sometimes doesn't end her chain with a Rosetta. Um, Phi will always, always, always come in for two. And their turns are predictable. If they do something with a two cost in the beginning of the chain, that means a Phoenix Flame is going to come in later for two, which means that if you're counting how many times they are going to attack that turn, you can know, you can stop the Phoenix Flame from triggering their Mask of uh, Momentum with that all you got, and it draws you a card. Um, if they come in with a phoenix with a phoenix flame early and they don't present another one in the chain you know they're coming in with like a lava burst right so it's kind of their attack patterns are predictable and this card just draws you a card the amount of times i've drawn like a command and conquer off the top and played it the swing big off the top and played it is pretty high um really good card and then sigil is the shocking one actually um clay was genius for this one in my opinion sigil i started off really only playing in like a couple matchups and at this point i have it in everyone except for Phi. i don't run into Phi. i don't have time to play a sigil with Phi. i don't have cards left over to play um sigil is how i won my viscerai game it funneled me through just long enough to get the kill so sigil plus tome of fiendal um a lot of the time i'll heal for five off tome, tome of fiendal so if you think about that, you're healing for 14 over the course of the game against the Rune Blade. Um, that's a lot. This is one of my highest priority Arsenal targets too, especially towards the end. So old him and Bravo stick this in your Arsenal. When they go to Command and Conquer, pummel you, sigil it out. You just basically erased their pummel, and you wasted a Command and Conquer. And now you can put your Blood Rushes or your big combo cards in there as long as you're counting them, right? Um, 
it's incredible. Um, a rune blades, you put this in your arsenal when you're kind of like at that low six, seven, eight, nine health, right? You stick that in your arsenal, um, do a pretty aggressive play. Instead of blocking at all, they'll go all the way down to one or two because they are positive they're gonna kill you, right? Whether it's rune chance or whatever. And then you sigil, you live, they're surprised, and now they're blocking, and now you're looking for a reckless wing. Really great. And then Tom of Fandal, I always ran one copy into basically every matchup. Um, heals for five if you have a big hand. It can enable some pretty nutty, like, small hand plays. Like, if you, you know, you have it in Arsenal, you're holding, like, a Command and Conquer in a blue. You can roll scabs, heal a little bit, throw a Command and Conquer or, or whatever, right? A couple of big ones. Um, Savage Feast really goes with this one, too. You know, pitch the blue, roll scab skins. Savage Feast, play Tom of Fiendal, heal, or, you know, reverse that. But really good card. I was absolutely surprised at how effective this was. Okay, so now for the most important card in the deck. It's Blood Rush Bellows. No surprise, right? Um, it's an Artivore that gives you an additional plus one. Um, the deck is built entirely around it. It is Brute's most unfair card in CC. Um, it is the reason you stand a chance when you're playing that fair game, the two-hand game, the defensive game. This is the card that lets you do 20 damage, um, sometimes more, um, but you're really looking for a minimum of 17. The 17 floor comes from your blue, right? If you end up having to play Smash Instinct, that is really bad. Um, Ending on a Command and Conquer and a Race Face, sometimes, you know, you're trading the point of damage. Sometimes is worth it, right? Um, you know, if you intend the cards out of their hand, they defend and they've been holding onto something in their arsenal. Sometimes I'll throw a Command and Conquer at the, de at the end, or even like a Contraband. It's like, you know, you pulled enough cards out of their hand, and you're just going to reset. You didn't really like what you drew. So th these are okay enders, but it's really not what you're looking to do. You're, you're looking to go for 20, 24. Or you look into scab skins and go into the 30s, which I've done. Um, so the entire premise is to pocket an important card in your arsenal that synergizes with Blood Rush. Um, early on, back when I first started playing Rhinar, I would always like hold Blood Rush and then put it in my arsenal, looking for that perfect hand. Um, I don't do that anymore. I don't think you really should be pocketing Blood Rush Bellows most of the time, right? There are certain situations in every game, but most of the time putting it in your arsenal means that you're going to draw four fresh cards. Three of them have to be a six. One of them has to be a blue. You can't control the variance anymore because one of those three is going to get discarded and you don't get to really pick like um, a beast within, right? Uh, when you hold it in your hand, you can kind of just trigger beast within whenever you want. But when it's in your arsenal, unless you're throwing away so many cards and you're really hampering your blood rush of fuel, you don't get to pick. Um, so the most important cards in order-ish, I would say. Um, Savage Feast has the highest ceiling if you roll scab skins. This is, this is how you can draw into yeah, like another blood rush or another blue or whatever, right? This card will break the math of blood rush pretty quickly. Swing Big is your highest priority normal target. Um, comes in for 10. Um, if you get that uh, red barraging beatdown, it'll come in for 14. That's a lot of damage. That's probably your natural ceiling. Um, Riled Up comes in for 9. Not a bad choice. Um, Alpha Rampage, only really against um, you know, Super Turtle decks. It's for the kill. Um, other than that, you're looking at Pack Hunt and Smash Instinct. Um, sometimes when these cards show up, Cadaverous, Command and Conquer and Erase Face, if the opportunity presents itself, you know, they've been holding on to something in their arsenal, they're really not letting go of it, it looks like a big combo piece, ending on a Command and Conquer after you kind of pulled cards and intimidated and then it just blows up their arsenal is nice. It, you are cheating yourself out of some damage. Erase Face, I'd be a little bit more hesitant on trying to end with that card. You know, like maybe it turns off Boost Dash. If they just didn't block anything and you throw it at the end, maybe. And then Contraband, if you ripped all their cards in their hand and you didn't really like what you drew and you maybe it's two blues or something and, and that's what you have, you can loop a Blood Rush, which is pretty sweet sometimes. Um, I would say Hidden Synergy. Toma Fiendal can do some pretty wild things with Blood Rush, right? So the key to the Toma Fiendal is to not play it early, right? So you have your four cards, 
you scab skins. You hit the four. Don't play Tom of Fiendal yet, right? Play your Blood Rush, pitch the blue, control what you're discarding, draw those two cards, and then Tom of Fiendal. Because um, sometimes, you know, if you do it in the wrong order, you can draw two random blues that you can't get rid of, and now your Blood Rush is over and you wasted all of that, right? Um, but Tone of Fiendal mixed with, you know, Savage Feast unlocks some pretty silly things. Um, but yeah, that's the priority, right? Always play it, always dig for it. Stick your best cards that synergize with it in your arsenal, and don't lose it, right? Um, okay, sideboard time. Um, I'm going to start with the heroes I like to play against the least, and we'll work our way into our favorites, right? Um, we'll start with um, Rune Blades. So for Briar, this is what the, the equipment suite is, Gambler's Gloves. Um, Viscerai, we're going to play with Nolan Rune Gloves. Um, the reason I hate the Viscerai matchup so bad is because, I mean, A, it's a super big counter to Reinhardt. It makes, it, it's impossible to block effectively. Um, but it also makes you give up Gambler's Gloves. And in the Rune Blade matchup, you really want to roll. Like, you need those combo pieces. You need to hit on that Savage Feast. Um, and the fact that he takes away your Gambler's Gloves is, like, the most annoying thing about him. I have genuinely considered, and I'm going to test it, <laughs> keeping Gambler's Gloves and, like, putting in Nolrun chest piece. Um, I'm genuinely considering it just because I hate that matchup so much. Um, but in that, in in the Briar and Viscerai matchups, we're going to play a little differently. Viscerai, we're going to have d -Rex. I don't really run d into Briar that much because they're just not needed, but he presents a lot of on hits. So another one of the reasons he's so annoying is he's like making you play his game. Sigils are amazing. They help me beat the Viscerais I played against. The healing... Um, the greed they go for when they don't know you have a sigil in your hand kind of like helps you cheat a little bit. Um, Tom of Fiendal, again, healing, card advantage, two card play, really good. Um, Command and Conquer and a race face for sure into Viscerai. These cards really help slow him down, make him block. And then the rest are kind of like tall attacks, you know. Um, I just go for the most effective attacks that I have. Um, I'm really looking to try and close it out as fast as possible. Um, you know, I'll also consider Cadaver's Contraband a lot of the time. You know, just in case you can hit that Blood Rush again, really threatens them, makes them block, right? You're really trying to stall them until you find Blood Rush. So whatever you can possibly do to stall the game until you can cheat just like they can with their channel mounts and their Revel and Rune Bloods with your Blood Rush, whatever you can do to stall the game, and this is how I do it. For Briar... I don't really run the d -Rex. I run Gambler's Gloves. I'm going as fast as I possibly can. I'm going to try and out-tempo them. It's very difficult. Um, but if you trade intelligently while blocking, like don't let them get the snatch for free at the end of the combat chain, you know, that kind of stuff, um, you can keep up. So I would run something like this, and then, you know, like I'll put in whatever d -Rex I have left at the end. Um, so... Icelander and Kano. My, I have a terrible track record in Icelander and Kano. Of my six losses across Worlds and Nationals, uh, four of them are to Wizards. Um, so you run the AB3. Uh, very effective helmet, right? This is one of the best AB items in the game. Uh, next to, like, Vex and Quill Hand. I go for the super tall attacks. Um, I want to I wanna, I wanna hit them as hard as I can with a single card, you know? Um, barraging, beatdown, any Intimidate card also makes them have to think because you're putting it on the stack and they either have to re react to it immediately without knowing what's in your hand or they're going to have to give up a card and it could be their ice card, it could be their important one, it could be their blue, it could be whatever, right? So this card buys you a lot of time. Um, you know, you'll see very different reactions from Icelanders when you play this card. Some will just blow their hand and they're like, oh great, now I'm just going to Blood Rush and you've, you've lost. And other ones will, will understand and like kind of respect it. And then you know, they have to play with less cards. So it works. Um, Sigil, super, super good. Tall attack, super, super good. Tom of Fiendel, buy you that health, buy you that time. Um, obviously no d -Rex. And then for Icelander, I'll put in a race face. And I'll put in the pack calls. And I'm really just looking for all of my sixes, right? And then for Kano, I switch these to the Command of Conquerors. It's really the only difference. Um... Again, I'm not the best at this matchup. I have a tr terrible track record. I beat a, you know, I beat enough Icelanders where I know I can do it, but I have like a 50-50 into it. It's for a deck that's supposed to have an advantage. I'm clearly doing something wrong, and I need to look at it. Um, so then we'll go into Guardians. Um, 
Gar uh, Guardians are actually one of my favorite matchups, so I kind of skipped around a little bit. But Guardians, uh, specifically Old Him, is a really fun matchup because it's just like it's a pitch stack off right it's it's whoever is being more effective with their hands trading more effectively playing the game more effectively tends to win right old has an enormous skill ceiling and i think reinar does too um so you're really looking to kind of punish them um and pitch stack right so my sideboard guide for them always look like this i just have this one sink below i don't know i just didn't feel like putting a contraband or a race space because they block two um so my game plan is to dig for my blood rush, present as much aggressive damage in the early game as possible to the point where they're going to have to start respecting you and blocking a little bit more than they want to, and then pitch stacking Alpha Rampage. So like I'll always throw like I'll over pitch an Alpha Rampage next to a blue and a barraging, and you know it's coming second cycle, and you know in old him you're gonna go there. Um, so it's really about that second cycle, where you put your reckless swings, where you put your Alpha Rampages. And then the damage you can get through with Blood Rush, right? Um, it's pivotal in this matchup to maximize your Blood Rushes, and you need to be 100% resourced up, right? I will pitch a Blood Rush to the bottom of the deck if I can't get it out fast enough, if I'm not finding blues, because that shield is going to give you a Frostbite. Um, you know, it's going to hurt you. It's going to block two damage, so your Blood Rushes have to have a blue, they have to have Tunic, they have to have everything. And because you know you're going to get to the second cycle, losing one Blood Rush actually sometimes really helps out because you're taxing their hand, you're taxing their hand, they're trying to pitch stack too, and then you hit your Blood Rush in that second cycle, and they just start running out of things to deal with it. Um, Reckless Swing is also an MVP, right? Uh, this this tends to beat old Tims. You pitch them near each other, you put one in your arsenal, you keep one in your hand, you can eat through uh, the Crown of Seeds and, and go over and then sticking a beast within in your arsenal is a really valid choice against uh, old him and bravo because they're going to command and conquer you like don't stick it in there if they've played three command and conquers but they're going to command and conquer you so as soon as you see the first cnc you're like okay yeah boom you know it's going to get command and conquered out um you know you get to draw a card same thing with sigil put that in there let them pummel command and conquer your sigil out and just you just play it right um the only difference between the two guardians is that against bravo you want your <laughs> d reacts because once a bravo gets temple tempo it's pretty hard to get it back um command and conquer is worth way more in that matchup so prioritize this card and then i just take out you know your pack hunts um you're really looking to be to be as aggressive search for your um blood rush bellows get them to block and then you know you're doing the typical like alpha rampage pit stack right use your sigils get all your health back um it, once you practice them enough you know it is uh, not that bad of a matchup to be honest it's pr actually old him is pretty easy and then bravo can be a pan ass if they just pop off early with cribbles but um that's the that's that's what bravo does right um phi is one of actually i really like playing against phi i don't know what it is um I would much rather play against Fies than Rune Blades any part of the day. Um, they just have such a predictable blocking pattern um, and attack pattern that it like really just kind of makes me comfortable. Um, so this is what my uh, sideboard guide would look like for Fi. Um, only consideration is that like I you know I do often put one or two contrabands in, so it would look something like this. Um, you can change these out depending on how you're feeling that day. Um, if you want to take the risk with the two block or not um no sigils either so this is this is actually what it looks like sorry everybody um let me find that last card where is it there we go okay so interesting card selection here is alpha rampage i won a lot of games well not a lot i won like two or three games against fives recently with alpha rampage um because with that strategy of swinging a big attack swinging a big attack and then blood rushing to make them block their cards are so bad at blocking that like you can just throw a naked alpha rampage and they might have a no block and a two block or two two blocks of the hand and they just die um it's also amazing at just sucking down all of their equipment right um so alpha rampage i don't like having too many clogs up your hand contraband maybe you loop blood rush maybe you don't command and conquer is probably your most powerful card in this matchup you want to read their arsenal and read your opponent like that is half the skill of beating them um if they're 
prioritizing something in Arsenal, there's you should probably try and kill it, right? Um, ending this after a Command and Conquer or after a Swing Big uh, with a Scab Skins play, um, after a Savage Feast play is really just like it, it hurts them a lot, right? Um, block their four cost attacks, especially snatches with your D Rex, and then that all you got always gets value. Um, you will always draw a card with, if with that's all you got, unless it's like, you know, they pull up the, um, they pull up salt to wound, you know it's coming, and you're just gonna block a three block with it to stop the salt wound from the wound from hurting you. Um, so that's five. Um, dash, uh, one of my least favorite matchups again. Um, kind of forgot about her. Um, so dash is a weird one because when they flip to hero, you don't know what build they are. They could be pure dupe boost dash. They could be mid range, high octane pistol dash. They could be that new control heal version, right? So you need to sideboard kind of in the middle for all three, right? So what that typically means for me is sigils, sink belows, and tome because boost dash, you need all of these to survive. Um, Command and Conquer, very valuable in the race phase, super valuable. Shuts down boosting, probably your strongest card in the boost dash. Um, doesn't do very much against control dash, but you know it, it still actually is pretty effective. Um, and then Command and Conquer, good for both. And then you want at least an Alpha Rampage or two in there, and you want Arg Smash for sure. It's amazing into all three versions. Um, uh, Alpha Rampages are really for that control version, just in case that you notice, I mean, you're gonna notice really quickly. As soon as you notice it's the control version, you are pitch stacking Alpha Rampages and you are playing for perfect blood brushes with Alpha Rampages, just like old him. Um, they have a lot of two blocks in the control variant. So, you know, actually it's pretty easy to start going over the top once you realize what they're doing. Um, the boost variant, right, you don't love that version. So you can play the pack hunts or the smash instincts on either one. In, uh, Intimidate are super powerful against the control variant, the mid-range variant, and then against the boost variant, you can kind of figure out, at, you're going to have to pay attention and realize what your win con is. Like if you hit your blood rushes early and you have your big savage feast turns and you're actually out tempoing them, you can get them to block. Um, but if you've sigiled a bunch of times, you've gotten a max, you know, bunch of health from Tome of Fiendal, you've really seen them boost out their combustible couriers, um, and their maximum velocities, you can switch to full turtle and basically, you know, watch them fatigue themselves, which is super engaging, but it is a valid strategy against boost dash. Um, it's a, it's a surprisingly tricky matchup, especially the mid range one. I, I, you know, like you, it really depends how well you use arg smash. And then it really depends, like, did they boost their high octanes? Did they boost all of their combustible carriers? Have they hit you with two maximum velocities? Right. Um, it's a game you really have to play by turn. It's not it's not as easy as a lot of the other ones where you have like a committed strategy from the get-go. You have to pay attention to what the dash is playing. You have to pay attention to what the dash is boosting. And then you have to pay attention to the game state, right? Can you fatigue? Do they have a lot of reds left? Have they only boosted yellows, right? Um, and then Arg Smash can immediately win you the game against Control in the mid-range variant. Um, you know, even if they're running Remembrances, by the time they get those items back out and into the field and they all don't block, you're probably going to run them over. So Arg Smash does wonders. I don't love playing at the dash. It was one of my only losses at Nationals this year. Um, it's a very close game, but Arg Smash I added um, and one more copy of a race face I added since then, and it, uh, and it has been much easier to handle the dashes since then. Um, I think those are the major matchups. Let me look up on my screen. I mean, Dromai, maybe. Um, Dromai, you just shove every six in. I put Sigils in, too. Um, I don't really run D-Reacts. I don't run these. So every one of my sixes goes into the deck. Um, and then, you know, you really just... Uh, you're really just kind of looking to Blood Rush five times. Right? Um, the key to losing this matchup, so the thing you should never do, is ignore a dragon or ignore Passing Mirage. If you ignore Passing Mirage, you're giving them all of the agency in the world. If you, Even if I have a Blood Rush in my hand, if they drop a Miragi and a Passing Mirage, like, I'm not playing my Blood Rush. I'm killing those two cards. They cannot exist. They, they need to go away, right? Um, 
if you play contraband, you're not going to get to the second cycle. Like, it's really unlikely. You know, you've blood rushed five times. There's not very many decks that can live through five blood rushes, even with the sigils and the healing and all of that kind of stuff. Um, all right, I think that's it. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.